I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Patrick Mahoney is a licensed architect and associate in the Amherst, New York based firm of Flower Mangu Manguso and Associates. He holds a Master of Architecture degree from SUNY Buffalo. And his professional work is extensive in office, medical, museum, residential, and retail buildings. He has designed over 5 million square feet of commercial space over the past 32 years. That's a great statistic. Uh, he was compelled to become an architect when in 1979, he experienced Frank Lloyd Wright's falling water. His inability to capture the feeling of falling water in two-dimensional media led to a goal of experiencing all of Mr. Wright's extant works on a firsthand basis. A goal many of us have, but I think you've gone a little further than, <laughs> than some of us, Pat. Mr. Mahoney has largely achieved this goal, meeting over 15% of the original clients of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Pat has served in numerous leadership roles with Wright sites and organizations. He was coordinator of the Historic American Building Survey for the Darwin Martin House in Buffalo. And he was also founding member and past president of the Gray, Gray Cliff Conservancy. He has been past board director of the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, as well as the Western New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects. And as part of that uh, organization, he was the recipient of the 2006 AIA Distinguished Service Award for Community Service. With all of that, he's had time to write two books. And the titles of those books are Frank Lloyd Wright's Walter V. Davidson House, An Examination of a Buffalo Home and Its Cousins from Coast to Coast. And the second title is Frank Lloyd Wright's Scholarly Clients, William and Mary Heath. So with that, please welcome, welcome me in joining, uh, in welcoming Pat Mahoney. Thanks for being here, Pat. Thank you, Heather. So I'll get right into it. So in today's talk, we'll talk about how Wright came to Buffalo uh, what the buildings he was designing initially were, uh, some of the influences upon them, and then after all that, some of the more recent things, the legacy projects, which have been a little more controversial as they were not supervised by Wright in construction. Uh, in fact, in some cases, supervised by some of his apprentices. Uh, so with that, So Frank Lloyd Wright was largely a residential architect in his career prior to his work in Buffalo. Although he worked in the commercial field when working for Lewis Sullivan, his own practice was generally residential. Uh, in Buffalo, uh, he was approached by Darwin Martin uh, upon the advice of William Heath. So Martin and uh, Heath were both directors of the Larkin Soap Company that was interested in finding an architect to build them a new administration building. So with that, William and his wife, Mary Heath, became the first clients in Buffalo to hire Wright since they needed a larger house anyway. They had outgrown their house. They'd moved from Chicago and, uh, and uh, had uh, his position in Larkin Company had solidified. He was essentially the only uh, educated person within the, the directors of the Larkin Company, uh, having not only uh, a degree, a teaching degree, but also a law degree. Uh, the Heats purchased land from Mary's cousin. Uh, Mary had extensive roots in Western New York and the, the property they selected, highlighted here on this uh, map of Buffalo from the 1890s, uh, it was a ornamental circle called Soldier's Place. Uh, Soldier's Place, part of the Olmsted Parkway system, Frederick Olmsted system for Buffalo, was where two parkways terminated before entering into the large central park uh, called Delaware Park in Buffalo. So this little red dot on one corner of the, uh, of the uh, circle is, uh, is where their 62 foot wide lot was acquired from Mary's cousin. Now, at the time, prior to 1902, many of the so-called prairie houses had been relatively vertical. So they, they, they weren't the, the long, low houses we, we think of. 
So, uh, so the Furbeck house in Oak Park uh, or the, uh, the Fricky house in Oak Park, the Husser house, uh, these are all houses that have strong vertical emphasis and a full three stories of uh, developed spaces. So uh, as Wright was beginning to design the Heath house, uh, he was transitioning in making the houses appear to only be two stories. But in fact, the Heath House is a three-story house. It just so happens that the, the first story, the first uh, finished story is largely below grade. So here in the, the rendering, uh, which uh, Wright later published in the Wasmuth portfolio, uh, we see the, the long low house. Uh, Wright omits the wells that lit the, the basement and whatnot, and, and does a number of things that uh, uh, in fact, we're not really built this way in the Wasmuth, really idealizing the, the design. Uh, the early plan of the Heath House was actually very symmetrical. And as time went on, the building uh, developed a largely asymmetrical quality. So uh, the house here, the Coatsworth House, Mary's cousin's house, originally occupied the entire lot. And she sold this uh, this portion off to her cousin. And uh, many people think that the, the Heath house resembles the Roby house in many ways because it's very close to the street. But in a lot of ways, it's quite different uh, because the house is largely closed off to the street, doesn't have a lot of windows on the street side, but has a large degree of glazing that focused on what was a shared landscape area with the Coatsworth house. So significantly, uh, this is one of the first instances, if not the first, where Wright uses two houses uh, that are essentially interfamily houses to share a common landscape space, uh, something he'd later go on to do in, in famous uh, designs uh, like the Martin House. So the Heath House was constructed through 1903 and occupied in early 1904, uh, and then the uh, the house continued to be finished for a while. Uh, parts of the house from its original conception were uh, were deleted, particularly the chauffeur's wing. Uh, so the garages and chauffeur's wing were not constructed initially, and uh, Wright would revisit this several times uh, in the coming decade. The Heath House started out as a relatively low budget house with a plaster exterior, uh, but generally grew both in size and in finishes, uh, incorporating many of the, uh, uh, the pricier details that uh, would be uh, perfected in the Darwin Martin House. Uh, some of those things are uh, gutters with uh, copper receivers for the downspouts and whatnot. Uh, and, uh, uh, the double lined gutter system that uh, that allowed the gutter to be completely horizontal yet drain fine. Here we see some interiors, some published in again the Wasmuth portfolio. Uh, this is uh, uh, Mary's father, Dr. Silas Hubbard, uh, both the father of Mary and her brother Albert Hubbard. Uh, the staircase is quite striking. The windows. Uh, use multi panes for one pattern. Uh, this is one of the striking uh, hanging light fixtures that uh, uh, once graced the house, but now are owned by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. Uh, Mark Hertzberg uh, did this nice shot to this house, it really picks up the iridescent glass. So the Heath House is quite expansive. Uh, in the 60s, part became a doctor's office. Uh, and this changed a bit one of the later parts of the house for when the, uh, when the uh, chauffeur's wing was put on. They also included a walled compound that came right up to the street. We'll see a photo of that shortly. Here we see that multi-paned window at the top of the stairs. And again, the, the great uh, fireplace on the first floor there's a similar fireplace to this size-wise in the playroom, which is the, the basement level of the house. So a, a daylit basement. Uh, uh, that uh, 
that room has never been photographed. So initially it was thought that the chauffeur's wing that was designed in 1906 uh, for the house was to be added on to the house uh, as it was eventually built. But in reality, the initial concept was to build it across the street from the house on a separate lot. Uh, they abandoned that idea and Wright uh, was able to adapt this perspective to the, the, uh, the end of the house itself, uh, which was constructed in 1911. Here we see one of the few photos that will show the, uh, the chauffeur's wing with a, a triple step uh, to its masonry. And here we see that compound wall I mentioned with the, uh, the chauffeur's house off to the right. The Barden house followed the Heath house uh, by only two weeks in seeking a building permit. And the Barden house was also an experiment. Uh, the experiment was with Darwin Martin. So uh, if in fact, Darwin Martin was satisfied with the dwelling that Wright designed for his sister, Delta Barden and her husband, George, then he would move on to have Wright uh, complete a large compound, the compound we know today. At one point, uh, Martin looked at having his brother, Frank, uh, have a dwelling adjacent to the Barden house, uh, which looks to largely have been reused as uh, the Harvey Sutton house in McCook, Nebraska. Uh, the Frank Martin house was never built. The Larkin administration building uh, came in about a year after the Heath house. Uh, so apparently, even though the budget uh, was not uh, met in the Heath House, the Heath House exceeded the budget dramatically, uh, the uh, Larkin Company was willing to hire Wright. Here we see the, the administration building in the context of the dense industrial neighborhood that the Larkin site was. Here we see another photo, this large lawn area was actually a railroad turnaround. So the steam locomotives we see over here were really right here, which is why Larkin needed a hermetically sealed building to attract the, the quality of employee they needed to deal with the correspondence of their, uh, their huge uh, mail order process. John Larkin Sr. was uh, not really a, uh, a right follower. Uh, Albert Hubbard had left the company before Wright was hired, uh, but Larkin trusted Martin and Heath, who uh, were the ones that uh, suggested that Wright, rather than Lewis Sullivan, design the administration building for the company. These dramatic images by David Romero really bring to life the, the building as it was in accurate color. Uh, I sent David images of what the actual exterior materials were, as well as the interior materials. And uh, I think he's best captured the, uh, the, the building in, its, uh, in, in how it really was. Uh, unfortunately, there are no color photographs known to exist of the Larkin building before its demolition in 1950. Here's some demolition photos from that time. In 2001, this was all that was left of Larkin, at least we thought. Uh, and it had been deteriorating over a number of years. This was one of the piers that ended the fence. And this fence uh, surrounded the building uh, on, oh, maybe two and a half sides. Uh, Great Cliff Conservancy was planning an event in the Larkin district, how it's known now, and was able to raise money to conserve the pier and uh, eventually place interpretive signage. The current owners of the building have continued that and uh, also had the street rebuilt. And in doing that, when the sidewalks were done here, uh, colored pavement and decorative markers explaining what the pavement means uh, were put in to, for instance, uh, explain where the atrium of the building was, where the original entrance was, and in fact, abstract the flanking fence pier and a small section of fence. 
I call this a ghost pier, uh, kind of in the vein of the, the Benjamin Franklin house in Philadelphia. The little patch we see here was the site of a sinkhole in 2015. Uh, so as I serve as the architect for this complex, uh, the factory building is uh, about a 1.3 million square foot building. Uh, so I received a call saying there'd been this sinkhole and that uh, I needed to come down and oversee uh, the workmen that would excavate the area and then put it back into service as a parking lot uh, over a weekend when all these cars weren't, uh, weren't there. Uh, so that gave me the opportunity to, uh, to dig around a bit. Uh, and in doing so, uh, these are some of the interpretive panels that are on the site currently. So in doing so, we excavated that area and found it was in fact one of the four staircases that outlined the main section of the building. So this blonde brick is this blonde brick and it still exists on the site uh, only about five inches under the asphalt. Uh, so it essentially tells us that much of the first story is intact and uh, uh, we're not quite sure how we'll best be able to uh, explain that and uh, interpret that to the public but it certainly uh, holds some promise for future areas to be excavated. I was able to get the building owners to allow us to excavate uh, a small section, the equivalent of two or three parking spaces adjacent to that ghost pier where the original garden level and sidewalks of the building still existed as well. So that garden area was across the front of the building section across the uh, what now is the glass pier that mimics this brick pier. This is the view from Darwin Martin's office or office desk in the center of the atrium uh, upon his return from a, a long trip to the West, which I, I believe was 1916. Note the right designed furniture and the spittoon as well as his right designed desk. So the Martin House followed suit at about the same time as the, the Larkin building. Uh, the house was largely based on a ladies home journal submission that Wright had made in 1901, a home in Prairie Town. The notable differences, uh, this house had a, an arched entrance. Uh, the Martin House has a much more recessed entrance. So it's, a, it's an evolving house. And although the Martin House is a three-story house, this screening wall and landscape certainly blocks the view and gives it the appearance of that low lying house that we would uh, uh, come to know as the Prairie House. When the house was first built, it, it wasn't exactly warmly received by the neighborhood. Uh, quotes like this, that Jules Verne might well be the designer of the house, or it was a house of many oddities, uh, it, it certainly puzzled the neighbors, that's for sure. Probably still continues to puzzle them now that it's the most famous house in the city. It's been wonderfully restored. Uh, here we see the, the floor cycle that uh, only went in the last year or so. The right designed uh, close, uh, close uh, uh, line markers and the signature plan the cruciform plan that uh, supposedly sat at Wright's drafting board uh, for the majority of his life. The central fireplace with its mosaic tile uh, really is, is quite striking as well as all the, the Wright designed furniture. The reception room uh, with the arched fireplace. Uh, this was the the, uh, the area we had our meetings when we did the historic American building survey drawings while I was I was still a college student. Uh, so having a roaring fire in here with the uh, 20 architecture students around discussing how we best document the house uh, was quite a treat.
the conservatory uh, features the Nike of Samothrace, uh, one of Wright's favorite sculptures. Uh, initially, Darwin Martin thought this was to be a greenhouse, but the conservatory is really more someplace to display plants rather than necessarily grow them. So a, a greenhouse was built as well. Larkin Company considered building right designed housing as well for their workers, uh, one of the projects that, that never came to fruition. Uh, it's been thought about uh, being constructed in reality adjacent to the Larkin complex, uh, but uh, no developer so far has thought that the size and type of units is really appropriate for today's use. The Boynton House in Rochester uh, was done, uh, Edward Boynton was uh, a, uh, a lantern distributor and built a fairly elaborate house, although it's a plaster stucco house on the outside, uh, its interior is extremely sculptural and it's uh, been restored over the past 10 years by its current owners. Uh, its dining area in particular is, uh, is uh, very striking, maybe one of the finest rooms I've ever seen. Here, what was the garden side you can see the lower section of glass and the clear story of glass for the dining room. Uh, unfortunately, this garden area was lost uh, when the, uh, the land was sold off and a, a neighboring house built there. Today, that house, uh, which sits in a historic district is considered historic as well. So it uh, would be a very complicated uh, procedure to regain this, uh, this area. Here we see from the backside of the house, uh, the drive hugged and went out to the, uh, the street closely. Here's that uh, dining room I mentioned. So a low ceiling, very intimate space with a table for four and then a much more dramatic large table with built-in lights and a uh, dropped ceiling with, uh, with art glass above. The Martin House Gardener's Cottage was built about the same time as the Boynton House. Uh, a relatively simple design, uh, but uh, certainly quite striking uh, for a gardener's use. Walter Davidson was a young employee of the Larkin Company uh, who uh, essentially wanted to emulate both William Heath and Darwin Martin, his, uh, his superiors at the company. And uh, considered building a house uh, relatively close to the Martin House in Buffalo. Uh, he first uh, was proposed uh, a house based on the Walter Gertz residence in Glencoe. So this is a house that was designed in 1906 uh, for Walter Gertz, but not built. So when it was adapted for use in Buffalo, uh, the program was a little different. Uh, you'll note in Glencoe, the walls are, are very long. They're shortened uh, in Buffalo. Uh, the glazing on the second floor is stylized a bit more vertical in Buffalo than it was in Glencoe. Uh, the driveway that would have penetrated the garden wall is eliminated in Buffalo. So uh, a future driveway would have to be coming in from the street behind. Uh, and Davidson was uh, thinking enough to purchase the lot prior behind the house to do that. Uh, this house proved to be too expensive in all likelihood, and uh, its design was abandoned in a simpler house that was based on the Isabel Roberts house in River Forest, Illinois, was constructed. So, uh, so this house was meant to be a $5,000 house and came in on budget at $5,300. Uh, because of that, uh, that budget, and it was a, uh, Davidson had gotten a mortgage from Larkin Company, uh, couldn't get a bank to give him a mortgage initially. Uh, so uh, when Wright would propose changes or additions to the house during construction, uh, Davidson was fairly firm in keeping the house uh, the, uh, the way it had initially been designed and contracted. Uh, so he came in on budget uh, we don't really have information about the Isabel Roberts house, but the Isabel Roberts house evolved more, particularly in its window designs and whatnot. Uh, 
Uh, it had a balcony that was proposed for the Davidson House, but uh, but uh, Davidson rejected. Uh, so uh, Davidson uh, sold the house uh, after only five years and thought it was the best investment he had ever made. In fact, he, he uh, sent a letter to one of the New York City newspapers. He moved to New York City after leaving Buffalo and uh, uh, said, I think he made a 300% profit on the house. So here's an early view of the house uh, before it's been landscaped. It was called Criswold, kind of a conjunction of uh, Walter and Christiana, the, his wife. This wall was shortened during construction uh, to allow for a future garage to be put on from the, uh, the front of the house versus the lot to the back, which again, Davidson eventually sold off. There was a smaller Nike of Samothrace at the Davidson house. Here we're looking from the two-story living room uh, into the dining area with its buffet. Uh, this may be the first time Wright was able to do uh, leaded glass with horizontal oriented diamonds. Uh, he'd certainly proposed it several times before, but I don't know of an earlier one built. Uh, Davidson also headed a group called the Tellinghast Place Association and hired Wright to design markers that would go at the ends of the street to distinguish the street that his house was on, Tillinghast Place, as a, a more upscale development than perhaps some of the other streets. Uh, so these were announced in 1908 in the press that they were going to build uh, essentially walls, garden walls, they called them, uh, Wright called them flower boxes. But essentially, they foreshadow another project in Glencoe, Illinois, that was, was uh, completed, the Ravine Bluffs markers for the subdivision there. Certainly this one's a little more abstracted, I think, than the than the uh, Tillinghast one, but very much in the same scale and style. Darwin Martin wanted to have a summer house on the Ontario shore opposite Buffalo uh, called Bay Beach. Uh, and this Borden Batten two-story house was designed in 1909. It had a budget of $4,000. The bids came in at $10,000 and the design was put on hold for about 17 years. Uh, we'll come back to that when it was proposed on the American side uh, for the site where Greycliffe is today. In 1923, Darwin Martin offered to give his daughter a right designed house uh, for her wedding gift. Uh, Dorothy Martin Foster wasn't uh, a fan of this design and opted for a local architect to, to build this house instead. Uh, this certainly has some kinship with the, the rebuilt Nathan Moore house in Oak Park, uh, rebuilt after a fire. Uh, so we can get kind of the, an idea of the, the richness that uh, the house would have had uh, looking at the Nathan Moore house. Greycliff was conceived in 1926. Here we see the stair tower that Wright approved eventually. This is the frontage. So it's about a 60 foot high cliff above Lake Erie. So the 250 foot wide, roughly 1500 foot deep property was split off a neighboring estate, the, the neighbor Dexter Rumsey, who also originally owned this portion. Here's an aerial photo from the year prior to the construction. The highlighted area is the Martin property. And you'll see it was a relatively flat area, uh, virtually no vegetation. There, there was one oak tree at the, uh, the center of the property at the cliff, which died during construction, uh, which uh, caused Wright to redesign the area we call the Esplanade today as a uh, uh, with a different design that was uh, not focused on the, the tree that was now gone. Uh, 
Great Cliff had its roots in a number of other projects. Uh, this is the McCormick House, designed for Lake Forest, Illinois. Uh, like Great Cliff, and Catherine Smith, the, the historian in California, came up with this idea that uh, it had seven glass bays, uh, and Great Cliff had seven glass bays as well in the center of the house. So a very transparent center and solid bookends. So really framing a view of the lake. Uh, unfortunately, this, this house wasn't built in, uh, in Lake Forest, but uh, Wright proposed this idea for a number of houses, often focused on that seven bay glass concept. Here we see Greycliff's second floor, and we see the second floor of a very similar floor plate at the, uh, the Allen House in Wichita. So where the Allen House uh, at the end of the Prairie period, 1917, has all its surfaces outlined with oak transitions, uh, Greycliff does not. Greycliff has a much more streamlined look, which is right reacting to the international style and trying to come up with a streamlined architecture that would be relevant in the 20s. The initial plans for Greycliff included a long uh, lap pool like space, really not designed for swimming, but just for reflection, with a section of stairs that angled down to a semicircular uh, terrace that would go into the lake. This would have necessitated blasting away much of the cliff. So rather than doing that, uh, Martin decided that a, uh, a scheme that did not spend a half million dollars rebuilding the cliff be, uh, be pursued. Here we see Wright's initial rendering showing that that uh, tiered area. During the construction of Great Cliff, uh, Frank Ledwright was having some issues with uh, some legal issues, uh, both uh, marital and uh, and also uh, uh, regarding uh, the immigration of his uh, his future wife. Uh, William Heath was called upon to talk to one of his close friends, uh, Assistant Attorney General. Uh, and former Buffalonian, Wild Bill Donovan, who was uh, uh, able to uh, call off the immigration service and clear up some of the problems. Uh, didn't happen all that fast. Uh, there were national manhunts for right and uh, quite, uh, uh, quite the, the, uh, the uh, drama at the time. Greycliff continued through construction in 26, all through 28, and uh, Wright made at least nine site visits to the property. And when he couldn't be there, Martin was fairly good about having construction photos sent to Wright. Uh, when he received this photo, it was accompanied by a letter indicating that the workmen didn't quite understand this area, which was supposed to indent. And uh, when Wright was uh, uh, queried on what to do about it, since they had built it not following the drawings, he suggested they rip apart the other end and extend it. Uh, so Wright being a pure artist really uh, would change the design every time he had the opportunity to. Uh, maybe one of the reasons that, uh, that Greycliff uh, was uh, fairly, uh, fairly expensive to build. Uh, the third building built on the property, which wasn't on the plan, uh, shown here in a site plan, uh, was the uh, the boiler house. Initially, Darwin Martin intended to build a flat roof concrete building with a chimney at all four corners, uh, but reconsidered shortly before it was to be built and asked Wright to come on site and design the building while there, uh, the resulting boiler house, kind of a miniature of the bigger buildings. So the Great Cliff was occupied in the, uh, the spring of 1928 and uh, and uh, was really everything Isabel Martin wanted. If anything, she wanted just more of it. So a number of additional phases were contemplated to, uh, to augment the estate. We believe this is Isabel sitting under the, the South Terrace uh, in the completed house. 
Here's the restored living room. Floor is very similar to those found at Taliesin. In fact, many of the, the decorative details and construction details, moldings and whatnot, similar to Taliesin. The entry hall. Wright designed at least 13 different designs for furniture. Uh, that was augmented with wicker furniture, some of which Wright selected at Marshall Fields in Chicago. A central feature that uh, made it appear as if water was flowing out the front of the house, trying to tie it into the lake, uh, was developed uh, as well in lieu of Martin's request to mound the circle, uh, which would have recalled Isabel's uh, experience vacationing in summers at Lake Placid. see proximity here the house is set roughly 90 feet back from the edge of the cliff. In 1928 the Martins uh, were interested in a, uh, a funeral uh, a cemetery design. Uh, they thought George Barton might die at any time so they were they were anxious to get it built and Wright's design uh, was essentially a, uh, a set of stairs uh, uh, approaching heaven uh, with a, a cenotaph at the top. This was the, the first of the legacy projects. So uh, Tony Putnam, Wright Apprentice in the 50s, uh, oversaw the construction of this. Uh, one of the disappointments was that cemeteries no longer use the cream colored marble this was to be made of uh, as it, the acid rain makes it deteriorate too fast. So uh, a little grayer material was used uh, and the proportions slightly changed to, uh, uh, to accommodate uh, modern day uh, cemetery uh, procedures. The Ahara Boathouse uh, designed in December 1905 from Madison, Wisconsin uh, was proposed in a number of places in Western New York and was eventually built uh, on the Niagara River uh, for the West Side Rowing Club, uh, now called the Fontana Boathouse, uh, sponsored by uh, uh, Tom Fontana in order of his, in uh, honor of his parents. The Buffalo Transportation Museum announced plans to build a filling station, uh, I think in 2002, uh, when I became aware of it, I let them know there was a Buffalo design for such a filling station that we now believe was the earliest of the filling station designs he came up with. Uh, so the, the most evolved version of that, one that was meant to be built only about five blocks from the current museum, uh, was used uh, and built inside the atrium of that building. This is the, the filling station that was built on that original site in lieu of the Wright design. Uh, Wright and the, uh, uh, the uh, treasurer of the organization, William Heath, uh, couldn't come to terms. Heath just could not believe that they were gonna be able to build the station within budget, which uh, probably was true. So here we see it inside the, the atrium surrounded by uh, Pierce Arrow collections. Because the building was largely transparent, uh, much of the interior floor plan could be derived from it without uh, extensively detailed drawings. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, this made it easier to realize such a, a design where some things designed only to that level would be much more difficult. Either way, we still consider this a building inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, certainly as closely as we could come to the original design, but there's certainly things that uh, that uh, we we couldn't uh, accurately predict. So these things go on. Uh, several years ago, there was talk about building a chapel that was originally designed for Berkeley, California, on one of the hotels in Buffalo, and with that. Uh, 
uh, that project seems to have stalled and most likely will not uh, be revived. But uh, in case, uh, I'm sure other things were uh, still in the works. Thank you very much. Take some questions. Pat, thank you. That was terrific. You're welcome. Um, I can't think of many regional specialists and experts in the right world, and you're one of them. And it's it was great to learn about these unbuilt projects. Well, I've had some great teachers. Jack Quinnen certainly has. Uh, Jack Quinnen gave me the first lecture I had ever heard on Wright when I was 16. And <laughs> really, you couldn't have a better teacher. You know, Jack's expertise in the Martin House and the, the Larkin building really are what uh, we build upon. So, uh, so I, I give Jack a ton of credit for inspiring all the people in Buffalo today that carried on. Oh, that's great. And we know Buffalo has built quite a tourism initiative around Wright, which has been interesting to watch. All right, we do have some questions. Um, a couple of them relate to Louis Sullivan, actually. Um, Jan asked, where was the Larkin building in relationship to the Guarantee building by Sullivan? So the, the Guarantee building is in what we call the central business district, downtown, essentially. Uh, the Larkin building was about two miles south of that area in a more industrial district. So where the, the buildings uh, were still 10 stories, but, uh, but uh, not, uh, not really in the area near City Hall or, or many of the banks and whatnot. So a more remote area of the city. Okay. And her follow-up question was, do Sullivan's plans exist for the Larkin building? No, I don't believe they ever hired him. They only talked about it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm really paraphrasing Jack Quinnen, but uh, uh, it's been stated that Wright disparaged Sullivan not being up to a job like that at that time, which, which may have been true, but, uh, but uh, essentially uh, uh, Wright uh, sold himself rather than giving the job to Sullivan. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a question about blueprints that were in both English and German for a couple of the properties that you showed. Was that from the Wasmuth portfolio and hence the, the two languages? They were. The Wasmuth portfolio uh, essentially came out around 1910. And uh, uh, they're, they're some of the, the most idealized renderings. So I think when I talked about the Heath House being an idealized rendering, Wright says in the introduction to Wasmuth that, uh, uh, then he made change little things that in the end, he didn't like the way the final building came out. So in some ways it was the next generation. Certainly Wasmuth was one of the more influential publications that Wright was involved with in the early part of his career. Mm -hmm. Kathleen asks, uh, I've read that the loss of the Larkin Soap Company administration building is considered to be the most significant architectural loss of the 20th century. True, do you agree? No, I disagree. I would say within the history of the world. So. Oh, okay, great. It... And the reason I say that is because the Larkin administration building, better than any other single building, represented the Industrial Revolution. So if, if there's a significant event in, in, uh, in human history, uh, the Industrial Revolution is probably uh, pretty high up there. So the building that uh, essentially celebrated a machine made thing rather than something handcrafted, uh, this is the, the real reason that, that the building is so renowned or was so renowned. Glenn says the picture of the Martin summer home under construction has some remarkable similarities with falling water, the chimney mass, the balcony and the piers. And he says, I'm assuming that is the lake facade of the house? It was. And the uh, uh, certainly, I think uh, Greycliff is incorporating many of the things that falling water would perhaps better integrate as a response to the international style. But Wright had been moving towards this. There were a number of buildings before Greycliff that incorporated these large open terraces. Uh, where a prairie house might have had a covered terrace, but the, uh, the, uh, to enjoy the sun and the water and whatnot, uh, the it more of an integration with nature in a lot of ways. 
And also regarding Gray Cliff, our friend Bob Hartman asks, am I correct in noticing there are no wood casings around the doors at Gray Cliff? No, no. In fact, that was one of the specific things that Wright was uh, uh, very adamant about, um, that without the, the wood, uh, the wood would have made it look more like a prairie house. Um, so certainly the, the, the angle of the roof is slightly steeper than a prairie house would be, but the streamlining of that stucco right into metal windows. Another reason Wright wanted the metal windows is that that was the, the those were the things that were key of international style to be a streamlined uh, kind of clean look. So a couple of questions um, that ask the same thing here, which is of the buildings we've seen today, which are open to the public? And I guess I would just preface that by saying what, what would typically be open to the public. And then of course, right now, you may want to check in advance if you can visit. Yeah, the, uh, well, uh, Great Cliff is open to the public right now. Uh, I'm not sure about the Martin House, although the Martin House is, uh, has some virtual uh, live tours. Uh, the, uh, the rowing boathouse is not normally open to the public. It's a rowing boathouse. Uh, the Blue Sky Mausoleum uh, is, is in a cemetery. You can any, go in there anytime you'll, you'll find the cemetery open, normal hours, uh, totally with daylight. Uh, the uh, uh, let's see, the transportation museum that houses the filling station is, is closed. So probably uh, uh, will reopen when the pandemic uh, lessens. Okay. Uh, the Boynton House is a private residence. Uh, let's see, uh, I think that's about it. We are getting another one soon. Oh, do tell. As part of the transportation museum, when that was going to be built, the the Carnegie in Pittsburgh had relocated Wright's office from San Francisco into their museum. Mm -hmm. um, when the Carnegie expanded, they removed it and dismantled it into 28 crates. Mm -hmm. uh, I encouraged the transportation museum to acquire it and put it in to the new transportation museum addition that was being conceived. Uh, when that building was expanded beyond even that, uh, it didn't fit into the program any longer. So it remained in Buffalo in crates for about 15 years. Oh, wow. Those crates have now been shipped to Erie, Pennsylvania, and it has been fully re-erected inside a building in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I'll let them tell you when they're ready when it'll be open to the public, but it will be accessible to the public there. <laughs> That's great. It, it's, it should have been already, but the pandemic has uh, kind of spoiled the, the grand opening uh, uh, splendor that would have happened. It's amazing these things can find lives somewhere else. <laughs> well, you never know. There's another crate sitting in Buffalo of the, the bedroom <laughs> wing of the Paul Olfelt residence, which uh, I'm still looking for a place to put that. So. <laughs> Um, someone says, on a visit to Great Cliff, I heard a story about a window built into a chimney. Do you know that story? Uh, well, there is a, a window built into the chimney on Great Cliff's second floor. So Isabel uh, has a suite that's kind of central to the floor. And initially, Wright wanted her bath to be in the middle of the building with a high ceiling and clear story windows that would uh, pop out the roof, very similar to either the Imperial Hotel suites or almost exactly like the suites at the Henry Allen house in Wichita, which if you haven't been to the Wichita house, you've gotta go see that. So anyhow, so Isabel rejected that idea and wanted the view of the lake from her bath. Uh, so having shifted the bath to the lake side, it happened to be inside the chimney mass. Uh, there are three, three fireplaces that surrounded the, the space. So the simplest way to give her the view was like the Roby house kind of, 
to provide a window in the chimney. So, uh, so I don't think it was a, uh, a mistake that the, the proportions are very similar to Roby house, but uh, I think Roby's window goes into a closet, but uh, here it's a more functional space. I think Isabel would have really liked a picture window, something very expansive, but she got about a two foot wide window. <laughs> That's it. Uh, what about the stone used to build Greycliff? Yeah, initially the stone at Greycliff was meant to mimic Taliesin, long horizontal stones uh, with pop outs that created shadowing, kind of emulating rock strata. Uh, but right on about his third site visit, realized there was an iron ore leaching out of the rocks in the Gray Cliff, the cliff at Gray Cliff, uh, which is a limestone, and suggested that they change the design so that uh, rather than use cutting the rocks into these horizontal pieces, they be put largely the way they were found with the iron oxide uh, facing the, uh, the exterior so it would cast down and uh, essentially warm up the otherwise grayish stone. So it wasn't the pretty yellow stone you've got in Madison. It was a much grayer stone here. So making it more orange uh, uh, really brought it into the right palette. So as I asked you the other day when we met for the first time on Zoom, what's the background building in your photo, Pat? Uh, the background building in the photo, and I'll just get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> the Ina Morris Harper House in Benton Harbor, Michigan. So maybe uh, my most favorite photo I've ever taken. So uh, uh, I had attended an event in Chicago at the, uh, uh, the Blossom and MacArthur Houses that the Building Conservancy had hosted and raced from there to Benton Harbor to get this shot at sunset. Uh, so up on a ladder on the public sidewalk, shooting this thing. So it's, uh, uh, it's again, you know, I, I, I can't take all these shots like Stan Eklund can, you know, Stan comes up with a thousand great shots, but I've got this one at least. So Stan's on the call. Stan, did you hear that? <laughs> um, let's see a couple more. I think we have time for, do you have any thoughts on the, on the new reception center at the Martin complex? Uh, oh, the, the visitor center? Mm -hmm. I, oh, they're going to hate me for this. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, well, I don't want to put you on the spot, but that's right, that's maybe right. just oh, have little, little, little controversy is good. But, uh, okay. um, I think it's a marvelous building. It's a beautiful, well-designed building that speaks to many of the needs that, that visitors have on the site. It allows you to sit, you know, within the, you know, without benefit of what the climate is and observe the site. Um, but as a purist, if you notice the photos I showed of Martin, uh, the visitor center was there and I've crouched down so the so the the foliage only shows the top inch of the of the visitor center. So I'd love it not to be there, but unfortunately we need restrooms, we need interpretation, all those kinds of things. So I think with the with the uh, with the scope they had, I think they've done an admirable job. Uh, and as other places have uh, struggled with how to expand visitor facilities, uh, we see one in Oak Park that's, that's been very controversial. Uh, it makes us appreciate much more what we've got in it, that it, it actually does so many things so well. So, so I, I, guess, uh, I guess we'll just, uh, we'll just love it. Probably best not to try to replicate Frank Lloyd Wright, right? But to go into a different direction with the architecture. You know, I'd love to do that. You know, I'm, we've got all these unbuilt designs for Greycliff. There were a bunch of uh, guest houses and things that were designed that uh, that weren't built. Um, and I'd love to like use one of those as an expanded visitor center. But the problem was in a museum setting, it, it really is inappropriate because it's going to confuse the visitor they're going to think that this was part of the original and and really misinterpret history. So so as much as I'd love to experience the other stuff, I think the way they've done it is the more appropriate. Mm, good point. There's a comment here by a gentleman in Glencoe, Ed Goodale, perhaps somebody you know. 
I don't think so, but I'm hoping oh. he's going to tell me something I don't know about one of those projects. <laughs> he does have a little bit of information here that I'll pass along to you. He said that Wright also designed independent structures for street corners in the Glencoe Business District, which mm. are reminiscent of the flower boxes which you showed. These were never executed in Glencoe, although we, the Glencoe Historical Society, commissioned in 2015 a scaled 3D print of the proposed design for the centennial of the Ravine Bluffs development. We will be including this piece in the exhibit, which we will be mounting when we complete the interior renovation of the Booth Cottage. Oh, that sounds go. fantastic. Yeah, that Glencoe Historical Society is very busy these days. <laughs> well, I, I went to the yeah. event before the Booth Cottage was moved. I had never been inside the Booth Cottage, so and they put on the both their uh, the museum there had quite a nice exhibit at the time. So I don't recall. I have to look at photos to tell you what year it was, but uh, but it. Right. Uh, um, many, many compliments here to you, Pat, in the Q and A. Um, also, a person who checked out the Benton Harbor House, and the owner came out and invited us, them, uh, invited them inside. They're they're lovely people, and I've recently seen some some really striking images by Andrew. Is it Pillage? How do you pronounce that? Stan will know, but uh, I'm probably maybe butchering it. I'm not sure either. Mm -hmm. But he's got a great interior photo of that house quite recently I've seen, so. That's right. Well, I think we can uh, wind things up here. I'm going to put myself on screen. I realized that I was um, a blank screen while we were doing Q&A, sorry about that. Um, but I'm here now and I just want to thank Pat again for his wonderful presentation and, and so much there. I mean, is there some, is there a, a good exhibit in, in Buffalo that one can, can see some of these things that you've talked about or do you know no. think, things that are unbuilt and that sort of thing? When you say, I mean, is there a central museum that displays a lot of yeah, these images? I guess, uh, I guess that's Not right, right now. They're, they're supposed to be an architecture center uh, in an H.H. Richardson design building, but there are pandemic issues with that as well. So okay. uh, who knows when that will be completed. Okay. Well, I hope that that comes to be so you can take it all in. And thank you to you all for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you at the next virtual Right Design Series. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. Stay well. <laughs>